Zimbabwe, one of the cradles of civilization in southern Africa. Here, people place their faith in freedom and happiness. Songs of joy. Energetic dances. Sculpture, painting. The gift of art seems to flow through their blood. This is part three of Glamorous Zimbabwe. This is Mavuku, 40 kilometers from urban Harare. In this humble workshop, Black Spring Stone undergoes a marvelous transformation in the hands of Alan. In Southern Africa, this stone is very common. Its high density and hardness make it the favored raw material of Zimbabwe's sculptors. In the language of the Shona people, Zimbabwe means city of stone. The destiny of this country is intrinsically linked to stone. The Zimbabwe bird on the national flag is carved from soapstone. The great Zimbabwe ruins were created from heaps of granite. And the marvelous views of balancing rock eroded by wind are now entrenched in daily life. For an outsider, the most charming stones are those which have been sculpted. Clean lines, robust modeling, vigorous and exaggerated forms. The art of sculpture, no longer constrained by regularity, has the capacity to violently shock. The shapes of rocks are irregular, and only a first-class sculptor can draw from its form. When you choose the stone, sometimes it will form cracks. You just work on the shape of the stone, which is left. On this one, I think I will work on the lady facing the side with the bag. Alan's tools comprise just a hammer and chisel. He stares at the rock for a long time, the full design lodged within his heart. In Alan's mind, the most important aspect of his sculpture is the human expression. So when I'm working on the piece, like ladies, like this one, you have to give the expression to make it like smiling to show that it's a piece of art. He finally polishes the face of the sculpture with sandpaper and smears it with wax. As it bakes in the hot air, the black gloss of the spring stone begins to shine through. Alan's works take the ordinary African woman as their subject, pouring water, carrying a child on her back, making sansa. Different scenes from life reveal a common open-heartedness and optimism. At first, these works were given an affectionate and lovable name, Plump Mother. Alan's aunt, Corline, taking her own rotund form as her prototype, created these sculptures. Alan continued her legacy and injected the uniquely optimistic personality of his wife into his works. To alter the family's future, his wife traveled alone to the Netherlands to study arts administration. In Alan's view, while they may not be affluent, they are carefree and happy, proud and content. He has renamed his works, The Proud African Woman. Alan's strongest desire is that his skills in sculpture will be passed down to his children. 
he takes comfort in seeing that his two sons seem to have a natural affinity with stone. They are still at a young age, but their sculptures already look the part. For Alan, sculpting is not just a means of survival. It's also a means of continuing his family's legacy. In September, Mana Pools is in its dry season. Herds of elephants have wandered to the forest edge, where they have stripped bare all the low-hanging branches. The most delicious of all are the seeds of the gum tree. For Lynn, this is the optimum time to observe the elephant herds. Lynn and her husband have stationed themselves in the forest for half a month, sketching and painting. Located in the subtropical monsoon and humid climatic zone, Zimbabwe's natural environment is beautiful. The spectacular waterfalls, primitive villages, and joyful people provide a rich inspiration to the artist. Wild animals have always formed the subject matter of Lynn's works. However, her favorite animal is the wild dog. Its magnificent stripes, unique expression, and instinctive habit of working in collaboration with others deeply attract her. Powell also loves wild animals, yet the style of his work is completely different. Every weekend, Powell travels to different parts of Harare to gather material. This is the time he is happiest. In Zimbabwe, the pace of life may be gentle, but people lead a healthy way of life. After work, he might meet with friends in a bar or join in sports or wander about the streets. This way, Powell can better experience the human life in which he finds inspiration for his painting. When I come to an area like this, when I do my drawings, I'm surrounded with 100 kids. They're all so, so curious, so anxious. They want to know, can they be like me in future? As a native Shona artist, Powell's works are not in the traditional African style, though. He focuses more on the life of the common man and environmental protection, and his works have a strong contemporary feel. Okay, we've got people cutting down trees. We've got uh, the dying legs, like Lake Chivero. We've got uh, the streets dumping off garbage. I want to send a message to the people. I wish to paint something that will convince the people. Powell, who was never formally trained in art, first took up the brush in 2009 without knowing where to start. He quickly discovered, however, his own unique means of creation. What message can I send which can be understood locally and internationally? And I said to myself, maybe for me to be heard, let me start putting the proper headings from the original newspapers to support my artworks. The fear of producing substandard paintings no longer troubles Powell. Labels from newspaper headlines, a vivid vocabulary, exaggerated movements and expressions, and the impact of rich colors have become his means of creativity.
African environmental groups are the biggest customers for Powell's paintings now. His increasingly mature works will enable his voice, an African voice, to be heard by the whole world. African art exists not only on display stands, but is interpreted in life and work. The homespun dyed cloth of home furnishings, the habitable grass huts, and even hairstyles are instilled with the unique imprint of Africa. People from all walks of life demonstrate their own artistic talents. Each year, April to June, is the busiest time for Mufuzi. As an auctioneer at the Tobacco Sales Floor Auction Center, his job is to quote the price to bidders through singing. When an auctioneer is singing, it's uh, basically uh, figures, yeah, yeah, singing numbers, but numbers are a representation of money. This was once the biggest tobacco auction house in the world. As the world's third biggest exporter of tobacco, Zimbabwe's tobacco is mild and aromatic. It has a uniquely scorched sweetness and contains few residual chemicals. High-end Chinese cigarettes all contain a certain proportion of cut tobacco from Zimbabwe in order to ensure the quality and taste of the product. The profession of an auctioneer is well paid and requires an enormous talent. Singers are veterans of the tobacco industry and have a deep knowledge of the quality of tobacco and the conditions of the market. Within just two or three seconds, they can read the vacillating look of a buyer and judge their requirements rapidly. They ensure that every bundle of tobacco is auctioned for the best price. Mufuzi was once a physical education instructor. His favorite sport was field hockey. This sport is fast moving and exhilarating. Winning or losing is decided in a split second. Mufuzi believes that auction singing, just like playing field hockey, requires careful observation and rapid resolve. Apart from adapting to his situation, Mufuzi has turned the work of the auctioneer into an art form. Using the simple number of the price, combined with the unique variations in tone and rhythm, he creates a distinctive melody. <laughs> You need to be in control and a lot of discipline. They, they enjoy the chant, they dance to it. They're supposed to enjoy it. It's, it's music. Auctioning is music. People should enjoy what you say. On the world stage of art, African music occupies an important place. Clear rhythms, lively melodies, and passionate emotions, when added to the exaggerated and powerful movements of the body, convey a unique optimism in life. Modern pop songs and music derive a rich inspiration from African music. In Africa, it is not blood that flows through people's veins, but rhythm and the drum is the soul of African music. This crisp and penetrative sound is produced by an idiophonic instrument called a marimba. With marimbas of different sizes, a joyful and versatile story can be told. In 
Zimbabwe. One of the most influential of folk instruments is the embira, also known as the thumb piano. The fingers pluck tines which produce a euphonic sound. Almost all native music makes use of this fantastic instrument. As night falls, a small-scale concert attracts many music lovers. The organizer of this gathering is Tementa, one of the best known of Zimbabwe's thumb piano masters. The earliest thumb pianos used bamboo strips to produce sound, with a natural resonating chamber made from wooden planks or a bottle gourd. In the Middle Ages, as the Bantu kingdom migrated southwards, this instrument became increasingly widespread. Contemporary thumb pianos are more standardized. The end of a steel nail is hammered to form a thin plate. Variation in the length and thickness of this plate produced different notes. Maybe it's easier to take that one. These keys are not finished because after you have to polish them. So this takes a very, very long time. Producing this type of thumb piano takes at least five days. There are between 22 and 28 keys, sufficient to perform sophisticated compositions. So now we know that it works, okay? Chimenza and his wife have improved the soundboard. It's semi-transparent and decorated with different colors and designs making it more readily accepted by the world. In the Roman Catholic Church in the Waterfall suburb, a grand wedding ceremony is taking place. In this country, music and dancing are inseparable. The pursuit of musical notes by the body is locked within people's genes. In traditional wedding ceremonies, a goat or cow is often sacrificed in celebration. In modern wedding ceremonies, however, this has changed to expressing best wishes to the newlyweds with the African drum and traditional dancing. These young people have formed a large group of 10 bridesmaids and 10 best men, and their sole purpose is to entertain the guests. The newlyweds are Sharon and Kuda, but what has attracted over 1,000 guests to their wedding is the father of the bride, Machiso. He is a national singer in Zimbabwe who embodies singing, dancing, composition, and choreography. This musician, however, sings only in Shona. As soon as the wedding is over, Machiso's band throw themselves into rehearsals for an important performance. In Zimbabwe, singers are rarely professionally packaged and promoted. However, almost everyone loves Machiso's music, and his songs are sung everywhere. Even if he drives in the streets, he's greeted with affection by those he meets. This unique creative environment may explain why he is so well received. Home is where he creates. He doesn't live in luxury, but he will take all relatives and friends in whenever they come here to find a shelter. An authoritative grandmother, a newborn child, rebellious youngsters, and a busy head of the family. They are all accompanied by music and dance. 
Encapsulated within this family are the feelings of joy, happiness, and hope, just like Machizo's music. Machizo likes to observe passers-by on the street. This provides him with a source of inspiration for his music. Before the emergence of the written word, music and dance serve to convey information and express feelings. Daily activities such as eating salsa, horse racing, and body painting are integrated into his performance. Everyday life has become an eternal theme in his music. I always think about teaching people not to do something bad to someone, even in, in family. There's mom and dad, so you don't have to fight in front of your kids, because they were watching you, seeing you, doing whatever you're doing, and they will learn it from there. So I always try to sing about it, you know, to, not to do that, to bring uh, the people together, not to separate people, yeah. August 12, Zimbabwe's National Sports Stadium. A grand celebration to commemorate Heroes Day and Defense Forces Day is taking place. The dancers perform a Shona dance, which recreates the peasants' joy at a bumper harvest. An instinctive joy makes the military band's performance all the more lively. The grand finale is a performance by Machiso and his band. Even in the pomp of such a ceremony, he has never celebrated great people or events. He only sings the praises of the joie de vivre of the common man. Within the stadium, 60,000 people rejoice with him. past, the stone sculptures bear witness to the vigor of an ancient culture. The artist, passionate about wild animals, has found a new theme. The sharp-witted auctioneer has a new plan for his life. The unsophisticated singer continues to draw from real life. For those who live in this beautiful country, Art is work, nature, heritage, and joy. It is in every ordinary and yet incomparably valuable moment in life.